Welcome to Lesson 6 of the DB2 on Campus Lecture Series. Today we're going to talk about how to work with database objects. My name is Raul Chong and I'm the DB2 on Campus Program Manager. This is the agenda for today and we'll start with introduction. So for the introduction, uh, this will be the database objects that we'll be, we will be covering starting with the schema, tables, views, indices, and then some database application objects. Now, not all these, all of these objects will be covered in this presentation. We will just talk about sequences in this presentation, but triggers, user-defined functions, and store procedures will be covered on a different lesson. So let's start with a schema. A schema is a concept that in other databases means may mean something else. Normally, when we talk about a schema in uh, relational databases, we think of the entire system structure, of the entire structure of your database. But a schema in DB2 normally refers to the, the prefix of an object. So every object in DB2 has two parts, as you can see from, from the slide. The first part is the schema name, and the second part is the object name. Right, and this is uh, divided by a dot. Now, the schema name does not need to be provided. It is not uh, a requirement to always provide a schema name when you work with objects in DB2 because there is an, an implicit schema name that will be used. So let me just give you some demonstrations on this. Let's say I will connect to the sample database and I can use a specific user, so I can say user db2 admin, and I can, if I just press enter, it will prompt me for a password, so I'm going to type the password here, and then I log in, and I'm logged in as db2 admin. Right? Now, if I do db2 create table um, abc dot T1, and I put any columns, let's say column 1 is an integer, column 2 is also an integer, and I press enter, I just created a table, abc.t1, where the schema is abc, and the name of the object of the table is t1. Okay, good. Now, let's say I want to select from table t1. If I just do db2 select star from t one and I press enter, I will get an error and look at what the error indicates. It says that the table db to admin dot t one is an undefined name. So when I issued a db to select star from t one, I didn't provide the schema name and then db two by default will take as implicit a schema the name that I use or the user ID that I use to connect to the database, which was db2 admin. Okay, so that's basically that uh, the behavior that is that is uh, the default behavior that occurs in db2 when you don't provide a schema implicitly. Now, as you can see as well from this example, ABC does not need to map to any user. So ABC doesn't map to a user in the operating system. Right. But when you don't provide a, a schema, then the user ID used to connect to the database is used as a schema. Okay, so uh, let me provide more examples. So if I had done a db2 select star from abc.t1, then in that case, uh, yes, I will be getting the right result because I, uh, I used the, the schema abc. Now, if I create a table, let's say that you do create table t1 uh, call one integer and I press enter. Now I've created a table with no schema, so again as before, I should have this table which would be db2 admin dot t1. So I would say db2 select star from db2 admin dot t1 then I do get the right result because now there are two tables, one with a schema of ABC and the other one with a schema of DB2 admin. And this is a typical problem that happens for uh, many new users. They start creating tables or objects in DB2 with different 
schemas because maybe they connected differently with a different user. So uh, because the user is used by default as a schema name, if you don't provide one, then they are basically creating two sets of tables with different schema. So that's a typical problem. And as I said before, a schema applies to all objects in uh, in the database in DB2. So even if I create a procedure, so if I say, for example, DB2 create procedure, uh, let's say P100, and it's a procedure that does nothing, so I just enter it like this, then the procedure name would be P100, but it's actually, if I try to call this procedure, I would be invoking it as to, to call uh, db2admin.p100, and it, and it finds it. Now, if you want to change the schema for your current session, you could do a set schema. So you could say db2set schema, and you can maybe call it uh, whatever you want, db2 set schema um, role, for example. And then from then on, anything uh, that you're doing would apply to or would start using this schema, which is a schema I just, I just uh, created uh, right now. So if I do now db2 select star from t1 and press enter, then I get this error because it's trying to look for raul.t1 since I said that my my schema, my current schema from now on, should be uh, Raul. Okay. Okay. So that's um, that's all I wanted to mention about a schema, and it is used basically. A schema can be used for grouping uh, a bunch of tables together based on the schema, um, and and uh, for example, some um, utilities in DB2 like DB2 Move maybe, which we will cover later, maybe using a schema for just uh, moving some specific tables based on this schema name. So again, the purpose of having a schema is just for grouping objects that are uh, maybe related. So maybe one group of objects could be used for tests or for development or maybe for production within a database. Okay, moving on to the next section, we're going to talk about tables. And you know, tables like any other relational uh, database system, uh, we we basically have the same or pretty much the similar syntax. So all I want to mention here is that uh, in DB2 you have to use the clause in, and then put the name of the table of space where you want this table to reside. So we talked about table spaces in um, the lesson about the DB2 environment. So uh, this is the syntax that you need to use to uh, specify where, in which table space you want to put this table. So and and defining a table is as usual. You specify a column, the data type, whether it's not null or null, and we'll talk more about this later, and whether it has some default value. So within tables, you have to specify columns, and the columns have to have a data type. So these are the data types that are supported in DB2. And the new one, with starting with DB2 version 9, is the data type XML. We'll talk more about this data type in a different lesson when we talk about pure XML. Um, we support large objects, which is a data type um, that is supported in DB2. And these are used, for example, if you store binary, large binary files, so we would use uh, blog block data type. If you use large character uh, uh, strings, then you can use clop or character large object, or you could use uh, also db clop as well, right? For example, when you st want to store um, double byte characters like uh, Chinese. Now, besides having built-in data types like uh, integer, character, blobs, clubs, or XML, we also allow you to define your own user, uh, your own data types. So these are called user-defined data types or user-defined types. And the syntax that you use is, in this example, create distinct type, the name of the type as integer. So basically, it will be built based on a an existing built-in data type, and um, the purpose of using 
defined uh, user defined data types is the following right? let's say you create a table like like shown here create table person and with uh, two columns now for this particular example let's before before using these user defined types let's assume that weight underscore p and weight underscore k are defined using an integer data type right so weight underscore p is storing the 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 weight using pounds weight underscore k is storing the weight using kilograms now what's going to happen if i perform a comparison between these two columns and they will define as integer if i issue a comparison like issuing a select for example where i say that uh, get me all the records where the weight p is greater than weight k um, what's going to happen is the query will be allowed to continue because in terms of syntax there's no problem but in terms of logic it doesn't really make sense to compare a pound and a kilogram on the same query so um, that's basically the purpose of using a user defined type to basically um, make sure that this type of queries cannot happen or basically you get error messages if you try to do such type of comparisons right so going back to this example then we created two two distinct types or two user defined types one is called pound the other one is called kilogram and then when created when we created a table we use these two new data types which are based on the integer uh, built-in data type and now when we issue a select statement for example here at the bottom we do select f name from person and we say where weight underscore p is greater than weight underscore k now these will fail right because these are two different data types even though they are based on the integer data type these would still fail and that's what we wanted we wanted these to fail because in terms of like logically this should not uh, make any sense so that's what we wanted now also here on this other example select f name from person where weight underscore p is greater than pound 30 here we have to put pound 30 we cannot just put pound I'm sorry we cannot just put 30 because that would mean that we're trying to compare weight underscore p which is defined as pound to an integer so we need to do a cast of the 30 and use the function pound now this function pound was created automatically when we added the following when we added as integer with comparisons in the definition of the 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 pound user defined type so um, so that's all I wanted to mention about user defined types moving on to another slide we have here null values and null values again these are uh, the similar concept as in other relational database management systems which means that they represent an unknown state and we can put not null to make sure that uh, you always put a value for a particular column so that's what not null is for and you can also put default values like in this example you can say not null with default 10 so that means that that column always have to have a value and if you don't put a value then the default will be 10 we also have uh, system tables and these are called system catalog tables so these are tables from the system uh, meaning that they store information about the system um, these are known as metadata that means data about your data so for example they will store information about what tables there are what columns there are what views there are what indices and so on and so on now there are three schemas that are specific to uh, catalog tables and these are sysibm syscat and sysstat sysibm are the base tables syscat are the views and sysstat are uh, also views for database statistics now you normally should not manipulate um, the tables you should not you know delete or try to make changes to the system tables however um, some of these tables like the database statistics allow you to make some changes to them and normally you don't work with the sys IBM tables but you work with the syscat views the syscat views so moving on to the next uh, slide uh, this is talking about 
declare a temporary table. So these are temporary tables in memory that are created by your application. So, so your application or many other applications can create their own temporary table and they will be dropped automatically once the, the application disconnects from the database. So these tables are useful because um, maybe you want to perform some temporary um, um, operation as part of your application and you can use a temporary table and the nice thing of this is that this is a your you basically have your own copy of this table so therefore there will be no uh, no contention so there will be no no locking no locks taken on any of the rows of this table because you are the only one accessing this temporary table there will be no logging though logging is optional there will be no contention with the catalog no authority checking so basically the performance when you access this table will be very very good and you can also if you want you can also create indices and you can also run run stats which we will talk about in a later lesson if you want to create a temporary table you don't use a create table statement what you use is that declare global temporary table statement and there are uh, different ways to do this so we provide here some examples and when you declare a global temporary table before you do that you have to create a user temporary table space so these uh, temporary tables will reside on this user temporary table space which are different than a system temporary table space and a system temporary table space is for example temp space one which was discussed in lesson uh, number two when we talk about tempor uh, the DB2 environment moving on to the next uh, slide we have identity columns and identity columns allow me to uh, generate a unique number for a column of a table so this is specific to a table and you can generate this column either as using generated always which means that DB2 will always generate the value and if you try to insert a value into this column you will get an error because you said that DB2 will always generate this value on the other hand you also have another option which is generated by default generated by default and when you issue or when you use this clause that means that um, DB2 will always generate the value but it will also allow you to insert a value yourself so you can insert your a value into this column and DB2 will not give you an error message now another uh, concept that is similar is sequence objects now sequences um, they are they are should not be covered here because they are not part of a table and we're still talking about tables but because they are similar in terms of uh, the, what they do with respect to identity columns I decided to put it here right? so sequences allow me also to generate a unique value but this unique value would be across the entire database so it's not like with identity columns which is only going to be for a specific table but sequences would be for entire database to create a sequence you use a syntax like the following and I'm just providing a, a, a very simple syntax so you say create sequence the name of the sequence is starting with what number incrementing by how much and whether it was it will cycle or not cycle so whether it's going to start from the beginning or not and you can insert this uh, sequence value into tables as shown here and you can use next file for the sequence so the next value for the sequence or you can use prep valves the previous value for the sequence okay so moving on to the next slide now you can work on quick lab number seven which is um, gonna allow you to practice on how to create a new table and so I suggest you to pause this presentation right now and take a look at uh, quick lab number seven instructions okay so assuming that you're already finished with, with quick lab number seven I'm gonna talk uh, about two features related to tables but they are not in DB2 Express C I'm just putting them here because uh, again you may you may be wondering if these features are available on DB2 and most of these features that many people ask me if they are available um, they are present in DB2 
but not with DB2X Press C. So they may be available with other editions of DB2, but not with DB2X Press C. So raw compression is available. And um, one easy way to remember what is available with DB2X Press C and what is not available with DB2X Press C is the following, right? DB2X Press C was designed for small to medium sized uh, businesses, for uh, the community, for university students. So Therefore, things that are applicable to large companies maybe uh, would not be available in DB2Express C. So raw compression is normally something good when you're working with data warehouses, when you're working with large amount of data, which would be available in, uh, in, in big companies, right? So therefore, raw compression is not available with DB2Express C. Now, raw compression is um, allows me to uh, basically compress the rows on a table and there is a there, there needs to be a dictionary um, it, it needs to be created beforehand but uh, anyway you can read more about this from the DB2 manuals we also support table partitioning which um, allows me also to do uh, what we call roll in roll out type of operations where let's say you have a huge table and you can partition this table across many table spaces and um, you can maybe roll out some information that you don't use for example uh, December of 2006 is old information so you can roll that information out uh, so that it's not part of the table anymore and you can roll in uh, let's say um, January of 2008 which is now something that uh, will be required uh, as part of your report that you're running so you could do this type of operation when you when you have table partitioning and also allows you to store more information because now you can store more information since you can spread them across different partitions so in this example for example you had um, you know that you could store information only in one table space and you could store letter from let's say it's a dictionary and going from A to Z but now you can spread this information and you can put some information in one table space from A to C another one from D to M etc etc and in terms of ut utilities you can also perform these operations or these utilities independently not on the entire table but you can also do it on the entire table as well okay so moving on to uh, the next section. The next sections, uh, views, indices, and referential integrity, we'll cover them very briefly because uh, most of these concepts are the same as in other relational database management systems. So then we talk, uh, we're going to move into uh, uh, views, and views are like a virtual table, and um, there's really not much different than any other uh, relational database management relational database management systems in terms of, uh, of views so you can create a view based on a select and then you can do a select uh, you can do a select star from the view or from uh, you can do other combinations you can select different columns from the view so you just treat it as a, another table but it's really a, a virtual table okay so with respect to indices we support uh, you know ascending or descending indices unique or non-unique compound cluster etc etc and this is a very simple example of how to create a unique index. Now, you could design your own indices, but with DB2, we have a tool called the Design Advisor. And I talked very briefly about the Design Advisor when we were talking about tools. So let me very briefly show you the Design Advisor. And I already started the, the control center here, here to, to save some time. So you can invoke the, the Design Advisor by selecting a database right-clicking and choosing Design Advisor. So let's start the Design Advisor. Now, the Design Advisor, or it's, a, it's like wizard, it's like a wizard, so you'll have to go through different steps. So, I'll click Next, and you can design several things, but we're just going to concentrate on indices, so we're going to not cover these other things that you may use also on other editions of DB2 that is not in DB2 Express C. So then we just choose indices, we click next. Now here you have to specify a workload. So a workload is basically a bunch of SQL statements that have also like in this example it's not only the SQL statement but you also specify the frequency of that SQL statement. So depending on the frequency um, DB2 
will make a decision as to what indices would be better for this uh, workload, given that frequency for those uh, uh, SQL. So I could, for example, click on Change Workload, and I could add more queries. So I could say Add, and I can say Select, Start from Department, and I can put a um, another name for these, so I can say SQL3, and this one is executed only 10 times, and I can click OK. So now I have another uh, SQL in my workload, and I can keep writing these uh, SQL statements in my workload, and based on this, uh, the indices will be created. So now I click OK, and I'm going to click Next to move to the next section. Here I'm just going to be um, uh, running a statistics on my tables because these would be used for um, for better calculating the indices. So I'm just going to select all the tables. I click next. How much disk space I want to use for calculating my tables? Well, I'm just going to click next and take the default. Then I can collect my my indices now, and um, this may take several minutes to calculate the the indices. But in this particular example. Um, you know, I just I just had three SQL, and I, I was not expecting really to uh, get any any indices recommended. But I wanted to show you that here, you know, you would get performance improvement. In this particular case, you get zero, and this space in this case, you also get zero megs. But you know, if you had a, a real scenario where you had uh, different um, SQL. You may get here a quick view as to what would be the improvement of using those indices and how much space they would consume. If I click next as well, you will get a chance to drop some of the indices that are not being used for this particular workload. And it's, it's good to drop indices that are not used because uh, if you don't do that, um, you know, whenever you're inserting or updating things on a table, it will take longer because you will also have to update these indices. And if you're not using the indices, then, you know, it may be better just to drop them because otherwise it would affect the insert update operations on your um, on your uh, database. So now if we click Next. You could decide whether you want to run now the suggestions. Well, in this particular example, there were no suggestions, but you could run it now, or you could create a task so you can run them later. Okay, so I'm just going to cancel from here. So that was a very brief uh, description of the uh, design advisor. And finally, we're just going to cover the last section of this presentation, which is referential integrity. And referential integrity means that basically you want to establish some relationship between different tables. So here, for example, you have you want to establish a relationship between the department table, which is a parent table, and the employee table, which is a dependent table or a child table. And you can do this by um, issuing or using primary keys and foreign keys. And um, again, there is not much difference in the terms of uh, the use of referential integrity in DB2 with other relational database management systems. So we're not going to talk about this in detail. Uh, we have some insert and delete rules. So you know what happens on one table, on the parent table, if you delete something on the child table, or what happens if you delete or insert something on the child table with the parent table. So these are some rules that um, are available as well. Uh, in DB2, like in many other relational database management systems. So with this, we have finished this um, lesson number six, working with database objects. So congratulations, because you've completed this lesson. And as to what is next, I would suggest you to start working on lesson number seven, database movement. Thank you.